It's C.J. Mitchell Jr. That's just C.J., no period or anything. It doesn't stand for anything. And Mitchell, M-I-T-C-H-E-L-L. Great. I would have made that mistake. <laughs> just like Harry Truman. Harry, yeah. Is Harry S. Truman? No period. Yeah, my dad was a C.J. as well. Was he? Yes. Oh, you're a junior. <laughs> All right, I want to know how you, we started chatting, but why don't you tell us for the camera? How, where you're from and how you came to Richmond? Richmond. Well, I'm from northeastern Texas, out in the, in the piney woods, the rolling hills and the red clay there. And uh, my relatives migrated here, primarily my uncles and uh, my father-in-law and some other relatives, some other people from that community migrated here during the Manhattan Project back in 1943. And I was a young man back home and, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old in that age range. And we would hear when they write back or people in the community talking about Hanford. And so they came out here and worked on the Hanford project. And then when I got to high school in 1947, I was just 16 years of age. And then I ended up coming to Hanford. Well, North Richland, really. I came into East Pasco first and then into North Richland. Uh, tell us about, um, and you, you were lured by the stories of uh, your uncles. Well, yeah, see, uh, my uncles and other relatives was coming through. You know, they had worked out here, and they'd come back home, and, and they could earn much more money, about three times the money here that they could earn back there. And so the word got around, you know, it got around pretty pretty fast. And people were going not only to... Uh, out here, but they were going to California, Houston, Dallas. They were they were just beginning to migrate different places because of the work and and the war and the opportunities there. So did you go by yourself as a sixteen year old? Well, when I came out to uh, to Washington the first time, it was myself and two first cousins and two other people from the community. There was five of us that came into the Tri Cities, and we lived over in East Pasco in a little tent. It was probably maybe eight, eight or nine feet in diameter and it was only about, oh, maybe three and a half to four feet high. So we didn't, so we actually didn't, didn't sit around in that. That's where we slept. But this tent sat just outside of two small trailers, maybe like eight feet. Each one of them was eight feet. Well, in between, there were some steps going up and on each side of the steps before you we were going to trail. There was a little place, maybe like uh, 18, 20 inches, where you could stand on turn to go in the door. Well, my uncle and his wife lived in one, one side, and my great uncle and his wife lived in the other one. And so for my coming out here, uh, for my lunches, my aunt would fix my lunch. And I think my, my uh, great uncle's aunt fixed the other guy's lunch. But anyway, they charged us a small fee for that. And then we had to walk... He had to leave East Pasco and walk down to downtown Pasco uh, on 2nd Street to the bus terminal. And then we'd catch a bus to Richland. And we worked out at North Richland. It was the city of North Richland out here. But they were working on the barracks and putting in the trailer court and all of that. And uh, so that's what we did. And that's we stayed there for a while. And then we, we commuted out here for about two or three months. And they finally built the barracks. And then we moved out into the barracks and that. Well, that was a system, a numbering system. What she's talking about is a numbering system when they were identifying people back in the time my uncles came out. Uh, I, I would say it was the government coming through the community. Uh, my uncles were named Willie Daniels. They didn't say for give him a 10, and when he gets to Pasco, there's a 10 that matches up with Willie Daniels. Well, then he finds out when he gets here that there's another 40 miles out to the town site of Hanford. And then he would tell stories about how uh, that some things he didn't know about, but he just kind of followed the crowd and asked questions, and and he ended up got made his way to Hanford. And then, of course, once he got it, he would he would uh, write back and and let people know. They wrote back. They didn't call back when using phones in those days. So what um, what was it like to work here? Well, when I first came, well, of course, everything was segregated. Of course, at that time. And over in Pasco, where we were living there, there was no, there was no running water and no, 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 uh, you know, there's outdoor facilities, you know, outdoor outhouses, and the streets were not paved. And so 
you just go to a spigot and fill up your bucket or whatever, you know. And then we did that for a while. And then shortly after that, we moved into the barracks. And when I moved into the barracks, well, we, we would live in the barracks, and it was two to a room. And that's where I ran into all of the, uh, the, the, the guys. I'm 16 years of old, and here all these men are that, you know, they have words that I hadn't heard before, and they were, they were, they were pretty, they could make a little noise and trouble, you know, so, and I was, I know my head was doing like this all the time, because I, I, you know, I hadn't heard stuff like this before, and then on Sundays, I would make my way back over to East Pasco, so I could go to my aunt's house, East man's place, and eat their cooking, and we'd sit around, we'd, we'd play a game called dominoes, I don't know if you know what dominoes are, but we'd, we'd play a game called dominoes, because it doesn't cost anything to play dominoes, you just play. And, uh, and in those days, we lived in the barracks for like a dollar and 40 cents a week. And that included daily maid service and clean linen once a week. Now those days are gone forever. <laughs> See those. But it was, and we had on our work crews, it was all, I worked on all African American crews, that African American boss, and I worked at Common Labor is primarily what I did when I first came. And I worked on, uh, well, the, the trailer park in North Richland also. That was my first job, helping put in the wash houses. The plumbers would go in and uh, put the pipes together, but they needed little little holes dug up so they could work, and they called bell holes. And my job was to uh, dig these bell holes for these guys. And so that was, that was, that was my job. And then later on, I, I got other jobs. So was it um, backbreaking work, or...? Not too bad, or? Well, the part the part was not real backbreaking. It's particularly in, in the uh, in the wash house area when I was working there because I would on their demand I would stay ahead of them. So when they got ready to work, they was already ready to work. And then on the other crews, when later on when I worked on other crews, it wasn't real backbreaking work, but it was steady work. You worked all the time. You maybe handle uh, you'd maybe like handle two by twelves or you know, uh, two by sixes, maybe 18, 20 feet long, stack green lumber, not green lumber, it wasn't any green lumber there, but but then they we do like cleanup, you know, like around the area where they're gonna pour cement, they have called cleanup crews, and, and that's for the trash and all that stuff to clean up so you could get ready to pour the cement and stuff. So this is um, a real education for you. Yes, <laughs> you bet. Because I had never seen anything like this before. It, how, you're smiling. It must have been difficult. Wasn't it hard to be away from home? Well, it was. 16 years old, and, and I tell the story now about being homesick. And if you've never been homesick, you don't know what I'm talking about. Because there's no sickness like homesick. And I'm 16 years of age, and, and I have nobody, no, no one in common, you know, as far as, uh, you know, my age or anything like that. And then later on, and then later on, uh, maybe this is like 47, and then like 1948, right after the flood, I worked on helping build a ranch houses in Richland. I worked construction there. And then in the fall, I worked on the 100H area. I worked a swing shift there, and I was on a cleanup crew there. That's where they are getting ready to pour cement. You'd go down and get all the trash out and get everything all clean and picked up there in preparing for that. So who were your mentors? Well, I would say my mentors would, would be my uncle, would be my uncle, because I had a lot of respect for him. Because back in Texas, he, was, he, he taught school. He was a school teacher. And of course, I had other, uh, like, my, I had his brother was here as well, plus uh, another, another uncle. And my father-in-law, who wasn't my father-in-law at the time, was here at that time. And that and, and, and these uncles on my mother's side, but also had an uncle here that was on my uh, that was on my on my dad's side. Actually, you had a whole crew of parents. Yes, yes, we did. Yes, they were all out here. But no cohort. No cohort. That's right. It was all I got homesick. Yeah, it's it's, it's it, it, was, it was a little difficult. Yeah. So did you go home at all during the Yes. Year? When the first year I, I went home, the first time was right after Christmas. I only got here October 3rd, but right after Christmas was the first time. 
and then I then I came back, and then uh, and and then I came back. Uh, that was forty eight, and then I came back a few few weeks, and then I left, and then I came back right after the flood again. So I'd gone back, you know, several times. It didn't take long, two or three months. I'm gone, you know. I'm going back. I was homesick, you know, and. Uh, and being here, like I said, if you if you never been homesick, you know what I'm talking about. Because I could see all of the the dirt roads, the railroad tracks, the schools of people walking, the terrain. I could see all of that, and it seemed like the clock would stop. It would never, you know, it, you know, it just seemed like the time was going so slowly, all the time. And then I came back the summer of uh, 19. I worked on the ranch houses after the flood, and then out here, and then I started beginning to to get a little bit better at staying away and then I stayed here through the spring of 1950 and to the big hard winter and then uh, one of my uh, persons from my hometown they and, and one of my friends that was a little older than I am but grew up with me uh, uh, we left and went from here back to East Texas through California and so we went from here to San Francisco and along about Williams, California, in there, there were some people. Some people approached us about picking cherry blossoms, which I had never heard of, you know, of anything like that. But anyway, we got into San Francisco. Once we got into San Francisco, and uh, we pulled a little small trailer house because the person who was with us had one of those trailers in North Richland Trailer Park. So we pulled this trailer park, and it might have been like a ten footer or something like that. But anyway, went into San Francisco, and my one friend, he left and went to the military. I went back to East Texas along with the other gentleman. We went back to East Texas. Well, this was 1950 by now, and so I married my high school sweetheart, June 3rd, 1950, and I took her right out of the fields to Chicago. We went to Chicago, and we stayed there for 15 months, and then I came back to the Tri-Cities. And once I came back to the Tri-Cities, I came back to Pasco, but I worked on McNary Dam down in Oregon. But I moved out to Hermiston, Oregon. I always liked to be close to work. So I moved out to Hermiston, Oregon and stayed there through, through the winter in the spring of 1952. And I came back to the Tri-Cities, worked on the Blue Bridge and also on the irrigation canals that were help putting the water down and through the basins here now, which we use so much now for all the growings that we do now. And I did that, and then I went. Then later on, I went to work out at the uh, hundred uh, K areas, the K reactors, and then from there to the Purex facility. And that was the last, the Purex facility in the two on East areas, my last construction job. And then I worked with General Electric in 1955, and that's when I started on. I started out in uh, fuel prep, where you prepare fuel elements for the for the react for the reactors. And that's when I learned that there was a break in life. I mean, as far as work break. When I first, when I went out there, we were working eight hours, just eight hours. That included lunch hour, which I was not used to. Then we had, um, and then we had locker rooms. We, I wasn't used to that. I was wearing air coveralls, and I worked on the can, what they call the canning line. And my job was to get up and take two fuel elements and put them in a basket, and they'd go down in a, in a, 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 a thing of alsi, aluminum alsi, and agitate. And then somebody would take them to the, put, take them over, put a cap onto the coolant tank, quench tanks, and that. And I was on the cannon line. Well, at 10 o'clock in the morning, the one guy, everything shut down. And this gentleman, he comes over and he said, uh, "Come on," I said. I said, I'll be all right here. And I already had a chair that was up in a big cushion about like that on it. And I could sit down. I didn't have to sit down in his chair, but I had it there to sit down if I wanted to. He said, oh, come on. And so I reluctantly went to went with him. And I go in there, and there's a, there's a smoke room. There's a, there's a restroom. There's about six or eight stalls, and guys come from everywhere. I'd never heard of a break. And then at 12 o'clock, I mean, at 2 o'clock, same thing. We got a break, you know. I, I worked days from 7:18 to, to 3:18 or whatever, whatever it was that eight hours total. I'd never heard of that. So we had a lunch room and all that stuff, and the, you know, the refrigerators and all. I never heard of that kind of thing. And I got so soft. I had moved into a two-bedroom prefab with a small yard. I got so I couldn't cut that yard in one shift. That's how 
going from hard work to essentially doing nothing. What I call work, essentially doing nothing. Okay. Now, right after I get into this facility and we start working, uh, and you know, of course, I talk to everybody, and there's a bulletin board in the in the, in the, in, the, in the locker room, and these jobs are gotten by seniority, and. Every Monday morning, they post these jobs. Well, when they post these jobs, I noticed nobody ever turned those jobs down. Whenever the name came up and they came eligible, they left. So I'm observing all this, and I said, there's got to be something over there better than what I'm doing over here. And so I started paying attention. I listened to people in the locker room, and we would go in and, and at lunchtime, and we would play checkers and all that stuff. And I thought I was a pretty good checker player. But I wasn't. Those guys that clean your clock, they were good. They were the checker champs. Some of them lived over in Kennewick there. They were checker champs. They were good. But anyway, just to keep going on the business of these jobs over there, I said, well, I, had, I, I, I played basketball back in those days, you know, semi-pro basketball. And one of the guys that had, was on the can line with me told me to come on and go with him to the break had seen me play basketball the night before. And then there was another gentleman, his friend, that played basketball. Well, in talking to these guys, and uh, I didn't have a degree or anything at that time, and one of the guys told me, he said, well, if you're going to go to school or anything, he says, if you never get a degree, he says, take as much math and chemistry as you can. You know, do that. And so I listened, I paid attention. So, um, <clears throat> so, and I said, I better go get something between the ears. Well, I worked there for about a year or a year and a half, and I'm observing this, and I got a wife and three children. And I got to think, well, you better go get something between the ears. And so I took, I took my bargaining unit, where I was working was a bargaining unit, where I had seniority. So I left that, gave that up, took a $17 a week pay cut to move out of that, because I knew there was something better out there someplace. And I left there and I went to what they call the 327 building which was what they did, examination of radioactive fuels. They did metallography on, you know, why, why uh, uh, fuels rupture and, you know, studying the cladding and things like that. And once I got over there and, uh, and, I, and I had started going to school, well, I would, you know, I'd go to school in the mornings because and, and, I was working a swing shift and I'd come in about, I'd go to work at 3.30, I think it was, something like that. But then I would go to that, and then, and then in the meantime, while I was going to school, because I had taken a pay cut from construction work to go there, I started at $69.97. That was about $35 to $40 less than what I was making. Well, I moved into Richland, into government housing, which helped out. And then I could ride the bus to and from, you know, to and to from downtown. I could do that. That was good. But going to school, some quarters I couldn't go because I had children. And there was no tuition reimbursement in those days. They didn't give tuition reimbursement in those days. And then they started giving 50% tuition reimbursement. And that lasted for a couple of three years. And then they started giving 100% if you make a C of better, and then I died and gone to heaven. You know, then I couldn't understand why anybody wouldn't go to school and take classes. Well, what I did, I looked at that looking back as a great scholarship. All I had to do was put in the time because there's bread on the table, you know, there's medical benefits in that. And so in going to school and doing that, I had gone to I believe I had gone to 16 interviews before I got anything. I had gone to my, I had gone to 15 interviews. And my boss, and they all knew I was working hard. And he says, I got an interview for you. And I said, okay, uh, I'll go do it. And I just, you know, I just, out of courtesy to him, I went for the interview. And when I got over to the 327 bill, and, and it was Radio Met, they called it. There was a guy named Bob Olson who was a manager. And instead of coming in as a $17 a week pay cut, he brought me in at a $12 a week pay cut, which was good. But during that time I got over there, I started working for a gentleman by the name of Mike McCormick, who was a chemical engineer by profession. And he had taught 
Todd O on the west side of the mountains, and he had some some he had uh, designed some of the waste casks and things like that that they use for transporting waste and different things you know fuel elements and things like that. And so in working with them, I, I, I'm learning all I can learn about about things. And they came in one afternoon and they said they had a meeting, all of us. They says we're going to uh, put on new shifts next week. We're going to put on shifts. And maybe not next week, but down the road away, we're going to put it. If there's anybody here want to go to school, go to college, CBC, Columbia Basin College, what we had, said we, they can volunteer to go, and that way we don't have to identify and ask people if you want everybody to volunteer. So my hand went up, which was the only hand went up. And so we go on back after the meeting, and I'm working every day, and about two weeks later, they call another meeting. They said, well, we're not going to have those jobs that we have. We don't have anybody to go to go on swing shift or whatever we need to do. But since my hand went up, they set up a special shift for me, which tells me that all you got to do, if you try, somebody will help. So they set up a special shift for me so I could go to school in the daytime. And that helped me speed up my time. And Mike McCoy, being a chemical engineer by profession, he taught me chemistry. I'd come in early. And he'd teach me chemistry and that, you know, that, teach me chemistry. And so that was, that was, that was, I thought was very, very nice there. And then as a result of doing that and continuing my education, there was a job came up in the 325 bill and it had to do with working with one of the engineers over there doing compatibility studies on rare earth oxides. And that was where out in the space capsules they had, uh, uh, they had parts of the space capsule would freeze up, would freeze up and get out in space. Well, these neodymium, they were using, I believe, they were using neodymium oxide for standing for samarium oxide or vice versa, whichever one was more radioactive. They, they do one that wasn't radioactive, which we call coal. The one that was coal, that's the one we used for our work. And we were using a miniature hot press to do these little pellets. And so that was an interesting job, and I were working one-on-one. -on -one with my manager there. And then uh, the civil rights movement started. The civil rights movement got going. And then they wanted somebody to come down as an EO specialist trying to upgrade people or give them a chance or whatever. And about a year ahead of that, one of my managers told me, he said, well, General Electric is doing some work on, they were getting ready for this civil rights thing you know, moving people up in that. And he said, you probably want to be ready for that. And so, and prior to that, moving my job from Radio Met to the other place over in the 325 building where he's doing these pellets, I had more chemistry than anybody else in the laboratory except for the people that had degrees. And I got that job over there. And I worked two and a half years over there with a guy by the name of Hal Fulham. Hal Fulham, or Wheel Wrights, and Lee Berger, some of those big heavyweights, you know, they've got all the patents and stuff, you know. I started working with some of these guys. And so then I got a job in human resources as their first EEO specialist for the laboratory. And once I got over there, well, I had been studying to be, you know, science and engineering, management, math and science, then I ended up getting a degree in business. But overall, I went to night school 14 years to get my degree. And because some of the quarters I couldn't go, so I'm like, you know, cause, because of family, you know, and that. And then, but I, I'd do it all over again. If I had to do it all over again, I would, I, I, I would do it. But then, out of getting back to human resources, there's opportunities. I always listen. I always listen in staff meetings, pick people's brains or whatever. And I had the privilege of working with a guy by the name of Dick Dibble, who was an expert in group dynamics. Uh, and he had taught over, he taught over in Western Washington, and then he taught later at CBC, but he was an expert in group dynamics, and I learned from him, you know, how to handle groups, how to work with groups, you know, how to do speeches without giving everybody else everything so you'll have something to expound upon, you know, once they, once they start asking you questions. I also learned that no matter how good you think you are, there's somebody on the other side 180 degrees from where you are. I learned things, and so I learned from these guys. And then, and then, uh, 
One day I just went in and asked my boss, I says, I want to crack at that benefits job. I think I can do it. He said, you think you can? I said, yeah, I think I can do that job. And so he gave me an opportunity to, you know, to do employee benefits. And of course, out of that, I learned industrial relations. I learned a lot of things about human resources, you know, and things like that. I learned that. And so, as it turned out, I ended up helping put in that 401k program and doing a lot of things for the laboratory. Then, additionally, just being in places, well, there was a guy by the name of Gary Peterson, and I know, uh, uh, he know, made it knows Gary. And there was a department there called Public Relations. And he was the junior guy. He was the junior person in public relations. Well, when he had the downturn, Gary had to go. Well, he left, and he went to a place called Hodasonics. But it was kind of a spinoff from the lab from Patel, I think. But anyway, but anyway, uh, he was doing all the tours for the not only the lab, but if, if not for our lab, but on the, others, on the other sites as well. And the other thing about P&L, or Patel at the time, see, they had some of their own private monies they could do things that other contractors couldn't do. For example, for every so many staff members, they'd have a tour of the laboratory, host you to lunch, things like that. Other teams couldn't do that because they didn't have the funds. You couldn't take taxpayers' money and do this. Well, when Gary Peterson left uh, the lab, well, it fell to human resources, which was personnel in those days. It wasn't human resources until later on. So my boss and I went with Gary on about three tours that's like 1972. Then Gary leaves, and then my boss and I go on tours. And my boss, he says, I don't like this. It's yours. And that's how I fell into doing tours. And I guided tours until out there, until last, well, actually for the lab, for, for P&L, until uh, last summer, I gave my badge back. Turned out they were paying more for, for training than they were getting out work out of me. But I had done work for them, and in the meantime, once I retired officially there in 93, but I went back on an hourly basis to help out there, but also in the meantime was doing work for Bechtel International with tours of their vitrification site. The, the staff here, going there, going, you know, how do we interface? So I was working with them doing those tours too, because the guy that was with them was my office mate over at Patel, and he knew I had done tours over here, and so that's how I got involved with that. And of course, I'd always been interested in main and the B reactors and all that. And once I found out about that, I just hooked up with these guys. But in the meantime, over at PNL and uh, and working with them, I got a chance to meet people from all over the world, because they had people from all over, and I would do tours, and it would be Russia, or Indonesia, or whatever, I would get a chance to meet people from all over. Plus the other people that they work with around the world, around the, you know, around the country, other labs, and then I did recruiting at the university campuses for science and engineers, things like that. So it turned out I ended up being a human resources generalist, you know, you could do it all, and then I could do, I did the orientation of new staff for like 24, 25 years, uh, in charge of tuition reimbursement, where people go off on educational leave and, you know, getting their advanced degrees and things like that. And I see people now say, it hadn't been for you, I'd never had my PhD, or I'd never got my master's, because the way I went to school and the way I got mine, you know, what they're doing is nothing. You know, I said, if you don't, if you don't want to go, don't, no, don't give me no sob stories. I don't want to hear. And, and I have people come up to me and tell me now, I said, if you could do it on your situation, I could do it on this. And you're why I got my, you know, degree and look back on that. And I've always been involved in community. Always been involved in community. And I've gone through the times when you, what it was like when you couldn't buy houses, and, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't buy a house in the city of Richland in 1965 because I was black. In 1976, when I moved where I am now, when I first moved in, the next night I get a phone call that says, this is the Ku Klux Klan and you are next. You know, I've gone through all of, the, all, all of that. And, uh, you know, and then 
just going through and when I when I couldn't buy the house, then I had like Civil Liberties Union, NAACP, I don't know, somebody wanted to come in and, you know, come in and step in and help out. I said, well, for us, we live here, our kids go to school, they walk down these streets, we'll handle it ourselves, which is what we did. We, we handled it ourselves and, you know, and it turned out for the better. And then I've always observed, and you know, I worked on planning commission, things like that, all, all kinds of things, community involvement. And then as our kids grew up, uh, we always in, encouraged them to get into student government. Uh, we always said, uh, you need to be able to get up in front of a microphone and say thanks. So when they were going to the grade school, or middle school particularly, we and God, we want to be involved in student governments, whether you're the president or the secretary, be involved in some kind of way in student government. We also uh, stayed involved with the school programs and we sort of helped set the curriculum for our kids because in Richland where our kids went to school, when you get to be, I think the ninth grade is when you start counting. But you got it. But you can get in there, and if you get in and watch, you can know what they're going to take for the next four years, and you can monitor that. And which we, and we all we insist they always take speech, you know, get involved in student government like that, and they all played sports, and we felt like one complemented the other. We never had any trouble getting up, going to school, and we think we never worried about you know learning. We never had any problem with them going to class and all that. And I always tell people, you can always learn. And if you give me the business, I can't learn, it's hard. Well, everybody knows how to sing happy birthday. And they, I know they can learn how to sing happy birthday. They can learn stuff. And so that's what we did. We always had our, we always had our uh, you know, be involved. And one of the best skills you can have is listening. And my son right now, who's a Superior Court judge for the Benton and Franklin County now, we, w we went over to my aunt's house in Pasco one day when he was about maybe 11, 12, and maybe 13. And I'm a big sports fan, and Richland, which is the big school here playing Pasco, they rivals. We go to my aunt's house, and the kids eat, and they always got something to eat at aunt's house. And on the way home, they wanted to buy hamburgers. I said, well, you can't buy hamburgers. We don't have any money to buy hamburgers. All your kids want to do is eat. And that's me. That's dad. So we get home, and there's a big game tonight. And I'm walking through the house saying, okay, everybody's got to get ready to go to the game. If you're not ready, we're just going to go to the game. And he turns to his mother. He says, I don't understand. He says, dad says we don't have money to buy hamburgers. I said, but we go into the game, and he'll buy us treats. He'll buy us anything we want once we get to the game. So if he never said that to his mother, and I don't get that feedback, I would have probably continued to do that. So I see that you can create all your own problems by the way you behave. And so if he'd never asked his mother, you know, I, I, I find out. So, so you learn from everybody. So I learn. And so I watch what I say and what I do and how I behave. I, I watch that. Now, as we go in through school, um, and Roseberry down at the down at the uh, library, which made it knows her, and our oldest son, who's an Air Force Academy graduate, well, he, she went home one night and her father was a liaison for the Air Force Academy. And he wanted to know from her, who are some of the young men that I think are worthy of going to the academy? Well, she mentioned my son, and that's how it all got started. And so he went to the academy and he played football there and then played in the Sugar Bowl and then he came out and he spent his 20 years and he retired as a lieutenant colonel. And then now he's come back home now and he's teamed up with Ann. He's on the library board with her and he's on the board of trustees and helping out here at the school. They're always doing, doing something. They're doing something. In fact, he helped develop the GPS system you use to drive around in your car. He helped develop that. And... Uh, and then as you go through and you keep doing things and you keep going and you keep going and uh, we've gotten all kind of awards. Well, the day I cried was the day when they put the judge on my son and swore him in, a Superior Court judge. That's the day I cried. I had gone through a lot of things, got a lot of awards, a lot of different things, you know, and they'd done a lot of different things and, and, and a lot of things good had happened. And 
there was tears of joy. Those were tears of joy now. They weren't, you know, I weren't, I weren't angry at anyone. I'm proud. I'm thinking about all the days that he, when he, he was a high school All-American in football and baseball. This one, he was, and he was the smallest of our kids. He was all packed in academic. He played in the Holiday Bowl and all that for WSU. And he had a chance to go back to Buffalo and run back punts. But instead, he went to law school. He said, I'm not that big. He said, he could see it. He, you know, and, and he had gotten an injury in Tennessee. He had, a, he had to do some against Tennessee, playing some way his own guy ran into him. But anyway, he went to law school. And so, and he had gone through, I remember all those days when he would leave going back to Salem. He graduated with Lambert down in Salem. I remember all those days when he'd be driving on Sunday nights at about this time, heading back to school. And, you know, and I'm, you know, you know, I'm thinking about all those days and everything he does now. I just smile when he, when I see him, you know, walk around or something like that or something like that. But, but that's that's the day I cried when they put the rope on him. You know, you see things happen. Now in the 1970s, I coached baseball. I coached American Legion baseball. And. And before, maybe I started 75 till about 79, I coached baseball. And during that time and now, even now, I can't go for a walk in the city of Richland unless, unless somebody stops and says, Mr. Mitchell, you need to ride. Now, in the old days, if I want to walk, I got to go down by the river. Because since then, if I go to start walking now, I want to manage to want somebody, screech, Mr. Mitchell, you need to ride. Well, I'm all right. I go along, screech, Mr. Mitchell, you need a ride? Yeah, I'm all right. That's a good feeling. That's a good feeling. Uh, another thing that happened to me that, that what goes around comes around, I had, during the time I couldn't buy the house in 1965, there was a gentleman, a real estate company by the name of Everty Green that called me up and says, hey, CG, I hear you can't. You can't, you're looking for a house. He said, I'll sell you a house. I said, that's fine, Mr. Green, but everything you got, your prices eliminate me. He has, he's on the upper end. See, and I'm down here. I just got a weekly salary, you know, and, and, and I'm trying to buy, you know, get die down here. But anyway, um, and I said, that, elim that, that eliminates me right there. But in the end, I sell real estate in town now. You know, I'm a realtor part-time, and, and, uh, and I did it since I retired in the lab. That was my planning to get into real estate. And I had the privilege of selling his home, Everly Green, the guy, that guy, I had the privilege of selling his home. And now when I go all the way back to the, we were starting out at unloading boxcars and the production line, there was a gentleman in there by the name of Forrest Grubb. When I first started on this education thing, he says, you'll never make it. He says, you'll never make it. And in 1969 or 70, when I got into human resources, they had a summer program where you didn't have to be an order, but it was based on income, you know, based on income. Well, but by that time, he had gone through a divorce, and I had one of his daughters work for me one summer. I had this guy that said, you'll never make it. And his daughter, and I ended up being her supervisor for, for one summer. That was a good feeling, too, to be, to be, to be able to help her. But from there, it just goes, and, and I got into officiating sports, and I spent 30 years in the OPAC 8 and 10. I worked a lot of World Series stuff, you know, and Olympic Games and stuff, and I just had a great career, good community. I live here. I had chances to leave, but I wouldn't. Another thing that happened in this, this whole thing, the Manhattan Project, like I said, I married my high school sweetheart. My father-in-law in our community back in East Texas there's always been things in the laws, looking back, that there was stuff for minority people that you never got it. But there were rules and things that where you're supposed to get a few things, you know, here and there, you know. And, and so my father-in-law, he got, he ended up getting a place, and I was a young man now, and I remember parents talking, and I talked to him about it later. Came into East Texas, he had a 157-acre farm, Mule, two mules, maybe a cow or something. And he brought an older home, 
You know, all the home came with it and all of that, plus the pastures and all that. And it was 4000 bucks. And all the whole community, all his relatives, everybody in the community said, this guy's crazy. This guy's crazy. They wonder what's wrong. Is he gone crazy? So his relatives from all around different area communities coming down to see what's wrong with him. Well, he had this, and then they did, the big house that they had had a dynamo in it. You know, a dynamo is a generator. Well, he had nothing about generators. The guy, evidently, the construction guys took the generator because he didn't know. He got kerosene. He, they rebuilt his house. He had kerosene lamp. Well, hell, he already had electric lights, but, you know, he didn't know the difference, I guess. But anyway, the, the continue this story is, is that in 19, whenever that was, he, he got that home, and he was a for a 40-year mortgage, and they thought he was crazy, but then he came to Washington doing the Manhattan Project. And he's one of these guys, instead of making X amount of dollars, he's making three times X. Well, in the meantime, his, his wife and the children stayed home and ran the farm while he worked up here. By 1945, by the time they dropped the bomb, he had the place paid for. And so they still have that place back in East Texas there. And I look back and think about the times when I, you, you ever heard a guy named Art, Art Link letter? Art Link letter? Well, I heard him say one time, you'll never have anything unless you, uh, if you're afraid to stick your neck out. You'll never have anything. So I've always stuck my neck out. It's gotten chopped off a few times. I've always known about real estate, never had any money. You know, work never hurt. I'll go on record and say I'd never make a good social worker because nobody ever gave me anything. And the ones that cannot work can babysit for those who can. So they can do something. There's no reason for them to not be able to. So don't talk to me about, you know, social stuff. You can do stuff. All the things I'm reading the paper, all the farming and all the apples that need picking and all the everything else that needs picking. So if you don't want to do that stuff, don't don't be looking to me for me to hand out. That's that's work. No it, it the work doesn't hurt anybody. I lifted the cross ties. I ran the old cross cut saw. I stacked the green lumber. I've got a toe missing when I was thirteen years old working in the saw working in the woods, cutting logs, you know, for for a uh, one of these uh, portable sawmills. You know, I've done all that kind of kind of work. And so that doesn't hurt anybody, you only get so tired. But the thing about it is, is that the story needs to be told. And the African American community is, you know, we hear about what it was like for me, but I never hear that story turned around, what it was like for the, for the Caucasian people that you know, from, all, from the time we had the segregation up until we still have it, but still up to how things changed. What's it been like for them? I've never heard that side of it. And it would be nice if somebody would come in sometime and, you know, and, and talk about, did somebody else have a change in how they, way they feel about things? And, and you know, all, all those kinds of things. And so uh, I'm open. So like I said, the best skill I think that a person can have is listening. You know, and when I, like in 30 some years in the old PAC 810, I ejected two people. If you're doing your job, you don't need to eject anybody. You know, and if you don't, and, 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 and if, 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 if Maynard's a coach and he want to talk to me, I don't know if he's getting fired at the end of the year or not. If he doesn't win, he doesn't eat. Especially college guys, if they don't win, they don't eat. They're looking for alumni people don't want them around if they don't go win. And then who do you think he's going to tell? He's not going to tell the players. He's not going to tell the alumni. So he's got to tell me, you know. So that's just kind of the way, it, kind of, kind of the way it is. So I just hope someday that Maine and I will be. We that they'll have a, a big thing out here. And another thing, sitting there, you can help do this. I would be pushing a dinner train. If I had some money, I'd be pushing a dinner train. Because there's too much out there to see. The Visiting Convention Bureau and all these other Tridec and all these guys, we got it right here. We got all the rail. You wouldn't have to maintain the rail much because you're only going to go 10 to 15, 10 miles an hour at the most. And you get off the B reactor. You know, and you go all through everything. If I had the money, I'd be pushing it hard if I don't have the money. <laughs>
But I don't mind telling people how I feel about that because there's too much to see out there. Out of all the technology that's grown out of what's going on out here and the man, other man had sites and all that stuff and what's going on out there and we may have created a mess, but we created so much, op so many opportunities because of what we what we've done out here. And hats off to these guys, the BB Act, and guys like you that are trying to do something about all this in here. And I have a real passion for all that, for all that stuff, you know. And and uh, I never get tired of the stories when the guy said, "This is what happened." He said, "No, that ain't right. That was before you got here. That wasn't the way we, you know. That was so. That's kind of fun." Now, to one of my first cousins that came here and lived in a tent with me, he's having his 90th birthday, and I'm going to Portland this Saturday, this Sunday, and down at the Civic Center there, and, and they want me to talk about, about family history. Oh, fine. So I'm going to go down That's there and hang out with him. He's 90 years old now, and he was one of the guys that we, we lived in that tent. That we came here and lived in that tent together. And he went back to the old 3C camp. You remember man, anything about 3C camps oh, yeah. and all that stuff? Sure, well, sure. see, he went to, uh, see, he was one of those guys, 3C camp and everything, and he went to, the, he was in one of those guys, and wow. see, some of my relatives migrated not only out here, but they went to Delhart, Texas, Ogden, Utah, all those, there's different places where they had different, you know, well, different a, stuff. Well, you know, the depression yeah. was horrible, but it was an yeah. opportunity, too. Well, it was. I'd be still plowing a mule. I'd be still in East Texas plowing a mule, really, if it wasn't for, you know, if it wasn't for the Manhattan Project. I'd still be there plowing yeah. a mule. Yeah. So when your relatives wrote back to Texas before you went to Hanford, mm -hmm. were they uniformly positive about their experience? Oh yeah. Well, they would. Well, well, when you come out of segregated, like you know, I mean, it wouldn't have gonna be any worse than that. And where you making a where you making a living as work? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. They were. Yeah. They came out here and and uh, when I first when I first left home and and, and uh, went to Chicago. When I first, when I left coming out here, I left with my uncles, with, with some of my uncles coming. Got the Texarkana, Texas. I don't know if you know where that is. The Texarkana, that's, Arkansas, that's Texas, right down the station, uh, State Line Avenue goes, this side's Arkansas, this side takes one right into the train station. Well, I, I'm all one of these, these guys that I like to go places, you know, and do stuff. You know, I'm a mo nomad kind of a guy. So I get back on the train, coming to Chicago, because when you leave Texas in those days, you come to Chicago, come to, St. Louis, Chicago, Minneapolis, and St. Paul, then on around, come down through Billings and down through that to Pasco. That's the way you came. Well, when you got to St. Louis, you don't have to ride in the segregated cars anymore. Once you know, you know, once you got to St. Louis. Well, I go and I'm on the bus and I, and, I, and I'm on the train. So, so I get back on the train and we're heading on out to Chicago. That's the first time with my uncles and stuff. I don't. I don't have I don't have my billfold. I don't have no money. But in the meantime, I had gone into one of those little booths where you you sell photos. You know, you take that. When I get back on the train, I don't have my I, all. I got my ticket and everything. So I get to Chicago, and so my one uncle, the uncle's brother, brother to the one that poured the first cement, he gave me twenty bucks. Well, my brother, my oldest brother, lived in Chicago, and his his address was forty o two. Lake Park Avenue, Chicago. I still remember that address, 4002 Lake Park Avenue. I get on that train and oh hell, I don't have any, I don't, I, I don't I've lost my ticket and everything. And so my uncle, they look at me, well, God, what's the matter with you? I'm, I'm acting like every other kid, you know, they're like, what's the matter with this kid? Well, anyway, I lost my, I lost my money and everything. So he gave me 20 bucks. And I got a cab and went to my brother's address, 4002 Lake Park Avenue. Well, he comes home, it's just him and his wife. Well, he comes on. They got a little places only. It's not big as much big as those trailers we were talking about, <laughs> you know. But anyway, I sleep in the chair there for a while. But anyway, I get me a job. I get a job, and I stay in Chicago for three weeks. I work for a place called. It was uh, it's Curtis Candy Company. I was splitting punch boards. You remember the punch boards? You go to tavern, you could punch out a punch, you know, punch them out, you know. Well, I worked for Curtis Candy. I worked there for three weeks. And I was homesick, so I begged them to let me have some money. So I do, and I get on the train. They didn't pay me all my money. I get on the train. I mean, I get on the bus, and I go to Paducah, Kentucky, go out through all the way to Arkansas, back to Texarkana. Then I got an aunt that lives in a place called Atlanta, Texas. It's about 
14 miles from where, where I've killed there, where I was born. And I get back to her house, and then three weeks later, here I am back in Kildare. My mother said, what in the hell are you doing back here? Everybody want to know, what are you doing back here? You know, I don't got to messed up. Well, I stayed there for maybe a couple of more weeks, and my mother went to one of the gentlemen in the community there, and I think it cost like, I don't even know what it cost, but anyway, I think she borrowed like 60 or 65 bucks from this guy and said, we'll pay it back in six weeks. So that's the way I got my money to come back to come back after I done messed up the other time. So I come back and I stop and I, I got a long enough layover and I get in Curtis County where I had to work, they finished paying me up. And so I came on back, so, so and then I came on to, uh, came, came on back and that's when I, with these guys, that's when I came in the tent with these guys after I had gone back and the five of us came back. Now I'll tell you another story. In 1948, when I come back to work on the ranch houses, well, I had gone back to Texas because I got homesick. So in Billings, Montana, I'm one of these guys, I always got to get off the train and do something. You know, I'm a newspaper guy. So I get off the train in Billings to get a newspaper and to get back on. And here's the train, it's going, leaving. And so I run and, I, and I'm like, I catch this train from behind. I run and I catch this train. And this is in uh, early spring, I guess, of July, getting close to July. But anyway, so I had left my coat and my ticket and everything else on the train. <laughs> so, so I end up, so I end up catching this train from behind. And so I catch it, and I work my way back around. And I don't know how far we out. And I finally get into the car where all of my my the rails and the ones that I'm coming back here with. This coming back this time, and they <laughs> and they they thought I was sure as heck I was been billings for good. I'm gonna stay back there. But anyway, I did some crazy things. But you know, in the end. Uh, I think it all worked out pretty good. I, I, I was never afraid to, to go places and, you know, and, and explore. I was never afraid to do that. And I was never afraid to work. But scary looking back. Yeah, oh, I feel very blessed of having been able to, you know, grow up. And, you know, looking back on, on uh, I grew up close to a railroad track, close to a school. But I remember the trains coming by and we would like read all of the writings on the boxcars and whatever. And if they had a new Northern Pacific or Union Pacific boxcar or, or tra car on that, we knew it. We knew it. We'd never seen that one before. And then we'd tell our friends, you know, about, hey, you know, you seen that new Northern Pacific this or that new Union Pacific, whatever it is. You know, that was kind of a education thing for us. Excuse me. Excuse me. And we had... Uh, Dirt roads. We had dirt roads and all that stuff. We never had, you know. When I when I married, they still had dirt roads and stuff like that. And, and I took my wife straight from the sticks to Chicago. Yeah, straight out of there. And but we still they still have properties. We still have properties. My family, both sides, has property there in East Texas, and there's nobody living there. But but we keep it up. We didn't sell it or anything. And so so we have a place to go if. If something happens, you know, if something goes belly up. And another thing I tell, tell, I tell a lot of times when I'm talking to people is, is that on my where, where I live down in on my, especially my mom's grandfather's place, there was a, there was water, a little stream come down through up from a spread spring up in the back of the back of the, we call it the field. And there's a little stream, maybe it widest from here to him sometime, maybe this way, maybe not. Maybe a fish or two in there or something like that. But anyway, from where where you could grow stuff was like 50 feet. That was the farthest you had before it starts. And when I moved where I am now, there was a guy who lived in back of me, he didn't put his yard in right away, and he had a garden. And he has a, a bucket, and he's got the most beautiful corn squash, peas, tomatoes. And I'm looking at this guy, and every night he would come home, he had no sprinkler, he'd get a bucket, and he would go water those plants. And I'm sitting there, here I am. This is 36 years ago. And I said, well, I'll be done. That's not really what I said, but, but it's something like that. But anyway, I said, I had water, I had the ground, I had everything I needed right there in East Texas and didn't know what to do with it. That bothers me right now. All I had to do was take that bucket, and I could have worked 30 minutes a day, 
had all the corn I needed, all the peas I needed, all the okra, all the spuds, anything I needed. And I don't know why we didn't think of it because whenever we set out, you know what sweet potatoes are? Okay, but they, they, they plant them, you know, and they grow like, you know, like the regular spuds. And, and uh, whenever we set those little vines out, we watered them from a bucket to get them started. I don't know why we didn't think to water them to keep going. We sat there waiting for rainfall, for it to come rainfall and water everything, and, and everything is right there for me. So, you know what? <laughs> I have to say this. God put it there. I just didn't know what to do with it. And that hurts right now. But right now, if I have to do, had, if something went belly up and I had to move back to the farm, I would use it to a great advantage. And I'm hoping now that my grandsons will go down and, and put in some tree farms and grow trees or something, you know, so they can, can use it. And I think they will. I, I think they'll utilize that. But it's been a great ride for us. And, and is a family, and we have, I have a wife and six children, and they know how to do things. And we always told them that you can always come back to nothing. Try stuff, you can come back to nothing. And so far, they'll try stuff, yeah. And my second son went to, the, he, was, he had a chance to go to Naval Academy, and he went back to the prep school during the summer, and he called one day and he says, pick me up in Pasco tonight. And we says, what? He says, well, he says, we picked him up. And he says, how'd you get out of there? He said, well, I told him they won't know what was my reason. He says, I can't do nothing for the Navy. They can't do anything for me. So he comes home. So he sent him home. So I said, well, you had your chance. You can go to school at Columbia Basin College. So he went over there for a couple of weeks. And he came back through his books down. He said, I, I'm not going there. He said, I'm not going there. So he's gone for about three weeks. We don't hear anything from him. So finally called my wife, he called my wife and she says, where are you at? He says, I'm at the University of Puget Sound. She said, you what? She said, he went to the University of Puget Sound, walked on, played football four years over there. She said, well, why are you over there? She said, he said, I looked at that schedule. He said, I see they're going to Honolulu next year. So that's why he went over, walked on, played. And he did. I mean, it's, it's amazing what kids will do. He says, there's no way I'm going to CBC. And the naval thing wasn't for him. And, you know, and he went, yeah. And then another thing, too, my daughter, she had a chance to be in the first class, first women's class at the Air Force Academy. She had a chance to be there. She had a chance to be in the first class. And my one son, the Sir George, who was a high school All-American, I came back from work one afternoon out at the lab, and he was sitting in the liaison guy in the Air Force and sitting in my office. And he was saying, we want guys like that to come to our, our school. Of course, my son didn't go there. He ended up going to Washington State University. Instead, but uh, but he had a chance to go. He had a chance to go to Air Force Academy, and my daughter had to be a chance to be in the first female class there. Yeah, yeah. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. And we did have we did have a few people earlier talk about yeah. what it was like to yeah. you know see the segregation and how oh, yeah. unfair they thought it was. Oh yeah. And one yeah. another person said that yeah. she didn't realize how. Unfair it was until she went to Virginia and really saw. Oh yeah, how bad you'd, it was. So, you'd be surprised how it took forever for my uncles and they did many hours in the city hall trying to get streets and mm -hmm. and paved streets and stuff over there and service over there in East Pasco. Mm -hmm. And before I moved to Richmond in '55, uh, we had they had what they called East Pasco Improvement Association, where they were trying to clean up some of the old rubbish, some of the old vacant lots that had a lot of trashy stuff on them, trying to clean all that up and make the neighborhoods look a lot better. And they had done all of that, yeah. Yeah, and it was, a. Uh, but, but the interesting thing, when I first moved here, when I was living in that tent over there, there was a guy who lived in downtown, just across the tracks in downtown and just to the on north, first and second. But anyway, he had a church. And people lived in this church for a dollar a night. They lived in this church, his name was Coleman. And they'd have to get out of there on Sunday morning before before nine o'clock so he could have service there. He said, they would look him a buck a night. That's pretty lucrative business. Many people get in the church at night, overnight, a buck a night. Boy, that's pretty good money. <laughs> in fact, that was good money. Yeah, yeah. The old cafeteria where we eat our meals is still up there. The old foundation is still up there. And in fact, today I got a picture. I got it over here of a guy showed me uh, the, the old trailer park and, 
and what it was like. So I'm gonna have it blown up so I can kind of see where I used to tromp around over there and everything, so. So when you first met those guys when you came up, the ones that knew all the uh, colorful language, oh, yeah. did it scare you? Did yeah. You people who inspired you or scared you? Well, I was scared to death. None of those guys inspired me, I'll tell you that right now. It was my relatives kept me inspired. And then, you know, and of course the money, you know, was that, it was good money. But those guys, I mean, they were, you know, I mean, they, I mean, that was, boy, you, you just, yeah, you know, 16 years old, these guys swearing, saying all kinds of stuff and, and that, and there'd be some of those guys that was from the Bay Area, and they'd jump in their cars on, you get paid on Friday around, in the morning around 9 o'clock. Well, about noon, those guys are heading to Oakland and, and, uh, and, and you know, in Oakland and, and, and uh, uh, Sacramento and places like that in Vallejo. They'd go down and come back on the weekend. They'd drive all night. You know, they'd get in there, they'd drive all night, and then they'd get in the Sunday afternoon, they'd drive back, and they'd drive back, yeah. Was it a dangerous place? Huh? Was this a dangerous place in some regards? Well, it wasn't, for, no, I don't think, there's not a whole lot of you know, nothing like that. It's just the way that they were. I didn't, I wasn't used to people gambling and, you know, and things like that. You know, I just wasn't used to all that kind of stuff, you know. That was, that was pretty scary for me. You know, and they, you know, they didn't seem to, well, there's just nobody my my age or anything there, so I was just in an incompatible situation as far as the social part was concerned. Concern there. Was it easy to meet? Uh, were there were there single black women around? The area? No, no. This was all. No, it wasn't. No, very, very. They didn't have any single black women here doing that. At 16, I wouldn't have been probably <laughs> probably scared to death still. But no, no. There was just few families around. But right. then, no. Because it sounds like there was yeah. a pretty active social yeah. agenda yeah. for the white uh, people that were, you know, there were a lot of. Probably for them, but it wasn't a whole lot of. There wasn't a whole lot of social stuff for blacks when they, when I, when during that time, when I came. And then, there's never been a whole lot of social stuff for blacks in the Tri Cities. Yeah, yeah. We've, I belong to a group now that we do a lot of nice, positive things, you know, and things like that. But, but, uh, yeah, there's never a lot of, you know, stuff to do. But now we just all kind of fit in now and get 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 stuff done and and everything. Well, we feel like we've earned uh you know we've earned respect from people in the community and things like that, and so we feel like we've earned that. And and, and as I go up my my day, you know, I just you know, I know you're gonna always have prejudices. You know, some people don't like hot weather, some don't like cold. You know and. Some people don't like the way you comb your hair, things like that. So there's always be prejudices and things like that. As long as you don't throw stumbling blocks, you get out of my way, I'll just give me the opportunity, I'll take it from there. Yeah, I'll take it from there. It sounds like there were a few people along the way who uh, earned your respect too. Well, yeah, and you know another thing too, see, you know how people are, I know, like when I used to work for McCormick, the guy that I was telling you about that taught me chemistry, and he told me, he said, CJ, he says, there's a lot of people in the civil rights movement, he says, there's a lot of people around here, he says, oh, well, oh, willing to help. They just don't want people to know about it. They don't want their friends to know. And it's always been like that. You know, yeah, you know, you got to know that. People will. You might mention, CJ, that McCormick, yeah. you know, he was our congressman. Yeah, he was our congressman, yeah. Congressman. Yeah. Oh. He's yeah. our congressman, yeah. and he was in, yeah. yeah, he was our congressman, see, and I oh, spent all yeah. those years with him. In fact, uh, when my son was at the Air Force Academy, he was—he said he was one of he was one trying to get his sons in the academy. He said, "How do you do that?" And he was one of you know he he'd begin to fly, pilot, and he was wanting the two of us to go. I says, "Mike, no way, I'm going to the Air Force Academy with you because Mike's is kind of a guy that if he sees a button and he doesn't know what it is, he'll push to see what happens. <laughs> That's just the way he was because when he would do research in the laboratories for clients and. He'd never say he couldn't do anything. He'd never say, I can't. And he'd work on all he can, and he'd kind of tell me, he said, that's the best I can do with the equipment I got. That's just the way he was. And so I said, well, I'm not going to academy with a guy like that. You know, <laughs> to just reach over and punch those buttons, you know. <laughs> I got to have a little bit more than that when I get up there. <laughs> but, but, you know, I learned, I learned from him and, you know, and that and the managers and everything out there and, and, I always got along good with okay, but I'll tell you what did hurt me though. Once I started, I had one of my bosses one time, 
that went to WSU with me doing, I was going to UCLA, going, UCLA was playing WSU, that's back in the days when Chris Chambliss was playing. So he rode over with me, he and his son rode over with, with us. And on the way home, he says, he wanted to know, what do you get for coming over here a day like this? I just showed him my check. Well, turned out, that hurt me in my, at home, back at, you know, work. When I bought my new home down here on, on, uh, on Spring, where I live now, that hurt me there. That hurt, that hurt me as far as my relationship at work. Yeah, people don't like it when you're getting ahead of them. You know, they think you're getting ahead of them. And I had one of my friends, when I was first started out, when I couldn't buy the house, this one guy, he says, I don't have to worry. He says, I don't have to go to school. And I said, after all, he says, I'm white. I heard him say that. He says, I don't say I'm white. I don't have to do that kind of stuff that I was doing. And then after I was, uh, seemed to be doing all right, and everybody worried about, you know, one of these days he might come back and be our boss. You know, you get all, all, all kinds, of, yeah. kinds of stuff, you know, you know, like that. But the thing, the thing about it is, is that uh, it, it hurt me on that. But the most, the most money, and this is a true story, the most money I ever made work for P&L was 37 5 And there's a lot of people made more money than that. But I got, but people didn't like it because I was successful in my sports. You know, I got a chance to go to Honolulu every spring and work a week, you know, and I always took vacation. I never missed days of work and all of that, but... And then my wife ended up getting a job, and she ended up retiring from Weston House, you know, and that. And, and if people think you're getting too much, they will throw stumbling blocks. And, but you survive it all. You know, you survive one way or the other. So, But anyway, here I am. What do you say? Where are the rings from? Oh, oh, well, this is, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to tell you, but this is the National Association of Sports Officials. Everybody owns this, NFL, NBA, everybody owns this. This is a championship ring from baseball. And what happens is I got like 12, 14 of them. I, I got like 21 World Series under my belt. Different, you know, American Legion, NC2A, and, and NAIA, that level. But in 76, when I went to Omaha for the first time, there was a guy from Detroit named Doug Cossey. He says, he says, hey, you guys, he says, if you guys give me 125 bucks, I'll get you a ring, championship ring. I said, well, I don't know this guy. I don't know this guy. You know, I'm not giving this guy 125 bucks of my money. So, and I come on home. Well, in 1977, we're both back at the College World Series again, and he's got that ring. And man, <laughs> he's got that ring. And I didn't know any one of those rings. And so ever since then, I found out that if you work a series, I cannot buy the ring. But the athletic department for their players can buy the ring. All I got to do is give, you know, pay for the ring, and they can get it for me, but I got to get permission to get it through them. So I got about 15 or 16 of them, and I wear them interchangeably. Because, because, but I learned how to, how to get them. And then when I was over at Columbia Basin College, I'm sitting there talking to the athletic director, and I, they wanted a title, and I asked, because that was my old alma mater, who I'm doing my first two years, I asked him to get me the ring. And that's what this is, and I'm from CBC. And he played at Gonzaga. University and I worked when I was working the conference. Well, he knew it from there, and he looked at me and I said, "Yeah, I'd like to." I said, "And I'll pay for it." Okay, I said, "Well, I, I said this is my old alma mater." I said, "I went to school here." I said, "I was on the board of trustees." I said, "If you go look in the board office, you'll see my photo over there." So this was like in when they went in 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 May, first part of June. Well, the rings don't come in until December. Just maybe to use it for Christmas, they give me Christmas presents. So I go over there and he goes there and uh, when he gives me the ring, he says, this is on the house. And I says, what? He says, on the house. He said, I thought you were kidding me. He thought when I was at Gonzaga, he didn't know I did all that stuff either. So then when I got it, it's on the house. And then now, the girls coach that wins, she taught high, she played high school and I refed her games when she was in high school. She's won three championships. So every time they win, I get a ring. And then when I go over there and they're both there, he's the athletic director and she's the coach. If I'm going to basketball, I'll take both rings. I have to watch what I'm doing because she'll say, well, how come you're wearing his and you're not wearing mine? <laughs> and vice versa, you know. And so, you know, they kind of have a thing going there. And, yeah, but it, it's kind of fun. But, yeah, you can, but you got to pay for them. You, you can get them, but you got to buy them, you know, and that. And all depend on the relationships you got. And I, I was involved in, 
rule changes, major rule changes, three major rule changes and stuff like that. And a lot of the guys working the majors, I worked those guys, you know, and all of that. Yeah, you know, all those guys. And I know guys all over the place. And 